Hi, this is Caroline Lewis here from Working Preacher, and we want to extend a huge thank you to all of you who generously responded to this spring campaign. We are happy to report that thanks to your generosity, we blew past our ambitious $50,000 goal and received over 61,000 from more than 1,000 donors, including 240 Working Preacher Sustainers. Thank you. We know you rely on this site regularly, and we are grateful that you took the time to let us know what this ministry is worth to you. We are so grateful for all of you who chose to become or to increase your monthly contribution to Working Preacher as a sustainer. We truly appreciate your commitment to support this ministry. Thank you for keeping Working Preacher working for you. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. The text for June 14th, 2020, the second Sunday after Pentecost, are these. Exodus 19, verses 2 through 8a. And there's an alternative first reading, which is Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 through 15, and also 21, 1 through 7. Psalm 100. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 8, and Matthew chapter 9, beginning with verse 35 through chapter 10, verse 8, or you can continue reading through verse 23. We are shifting seasons into what is in the Christian calendar ordinary time, and we'll be picking up with ordinary 11a. Um, and Ralph, I'm going to tag over to you to explain the two different Old Testament readings. Well, because the, the, the lectionary switched the way they do it a few years ago from starting with just week one is week one, uh, following the Holy Trinity Sunday in Ordinary or Pentecost, uh, depending on the tradition. Instead, they do like the, the Sunday falling between, you know, June 7th and June 14th or whatever. Um, the result is that for, um, for, for traditions that use um, a, the semi-continuous Old Testament reading, it's really weird because you start not with Genesis 1, this being year A, which really does um, the Pentateuch. We start with Genesis 18 in the semi-continuous. So that's really, um, I know uh, I've been written, I've received emails from people who told me they're gonna follow the Old Testament and preach the Old Testament all summer. And so for those folks that are doing the semi-continuous preaching the Old Testament all summer, you're starting the Genesis story in a really weird place, right? Genesis 18. So um, the, um, for those traditions that use the complementary reading, uh, which is Exodus 19 this week, obviously that doesn't have as big an impact, but just so, um, just so people realize that's where we're landing down and also um, so for the rest of Pentecost, we'll have these two different Old Testament tracts. We, uh, because um, we come from, a, uh, our seminary, Luther Seminary, comes from a tradition that uses the complementary reading. The psalm is always the complementary psalm uh, for that reading, rather than a different psalm, which we don't cover, which is to the semi-continuous. So there wow. everything you needed or didn't want to know about how the Old Testament readings happen in Pentecost. I'm glad that you get those emails and I don't. Well, I'm glad I get them too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God it's all Matthew all the time from this point forward. So uh, gospel reading won't let you down. Yeah, well, should we uh, start there with the Matthew? Uh, and I, I think one thing that we want to remember is that we're coming off of the Great Commission, which was the text from uh, Holy Trinity Sunday. And I think that's a, actually a good lens through which to read uh, this particular passage. Um, now going back to chapter nine and chapter 10 is, and it's one way to even read Matthew uh, in many respects. You could read Matthew forward through the Beatitudes, but also read Matthew 
uh, retrospectively or rereading, uh, rereading the gospel through the Great Commission. And because this is where you are getting uh, the language of, of these, uh, the identity of these disciples who are apostles in chapter uh, 10, verse 2. These are the names of the 12 apostles. And this is the only time in Matthew that the disciples are called the apostles. And so uh, it's and so this this idea of being sent and uh, and particularly within the context of uh, the Great Commission, I think, is a, a really important lens through which to view discipleship in Matthew, but also uh, that the that the entirety of this of this of this passage is uh, for the sake of uh, where this gospel is going. And that is uh, to, you know, to uh, baptize, baptize all nations. I'll confess that I'm really happy we're back to Matthew after, um, after you know, Lent and Easter. I've really come to appreciate contending with this gospel a lot more uh, this year, but also three years ago. I think as, as you start to bring people back into it, and what's really a, a, a disturbing speech, uh, at least aspects of the speech are, are disturbing, the kind of world Jesus describes, especially if you add verses 9 through 23 and the kind of reception he describes, the stakes are incredibly high. There is a they out there who's out to cause you trouble. We should talk about that in a little bit. But it's, you know, this is a gospel that is dealing, I think, with, uh, with, faith that is anxious about who's true and who's false, who's, who's an ally and who's a foe. It's a gospel that says the same kind of hostility that, was, that, was, that met Jesus will also meet his followers. And so to read this in a, what I think is a really polarized, not just, re, not just political, but religious landscape, uh, at least where I live, is, is really important because um, you have to understand a bit about who the players are, who the groups are that seem to be kind of beneath the surface here in Matthew. And it's, you know, I, I feel like I indwell an anxious Christian culture uh, in, a, in a Christian culture that's lost the ability to trust uh, in some ways as well and wonders uh, what's doing us harm that we thought was safe uh, and what's, what's safe that, uh, that we've been ignoring as well and avoiding. And also paying attention to uh, just that that recognition of being called out in intolerable times. Um, uh, you you mentioned it, Matt, that these are um, uh, polarized times. So there's a a political polarization, there's a religious polarization, there's a racial polarization, uh, and and to be able to name that this this ancient text is so incredibly relevant for. 2020, uh, that um, we have, uh, we're being sent out into a hostile uh, world, and that the very people that we think um, would receive uh, the promise of healing, of life, of um, uh, the removal of evil, um, are, may not want to receive us. And, and Jesus knows that. Um, there's, a, there's, a, a, there's a comfort in the sense that God knows that it's almost like the, the words to, to the uh, prophet Isaiah, you know, folks aren't going to hear you. And um, God knows that. God knows the chaos that we are trying to speak peace into. And... Um, as hard as it is, it's also uh, comforting for me to know that God gets it um, when I want to, you know, just throw up my hands and say, really? I think one of the, I, yeah, I appreciate that, Joy. I think one of the interesting things about Matthew, and Matt, you, you know, you, you're glad to be back in um, Matthew. I'm, it, I'm working, I'm working my way toward that. Uh, but I was I was actually doing a uh, overview of the Pentecost text with a group of 
pastors in Southeast Minnesota about a month or so ago, talking about themes in Matthew. And one of the things that I, that I noticed and that I lifted up with that group was the way in which uh, not necessarily blessings, you know, like official beatitudes appear throughout Matthew, uh, which you get, you get that in, in Revelation, but these, these sort of, um, these hints of blessing in the midst of rather difficult and or harsh words. And so that, that uh, you have this really, this juxtaposition, if you will, of these, of, of these realities, but at the same time, uh, you have the reminders of, 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 of this, again, lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. And so, which I think is a really interesting place for a preacher to, to res reside in that tension. But like in this passage, as you go, proclaim the good news, the kingdom of heaven has come near. And so my question was like, well, do we really trust God? Or do we really trust Jesus about that? That the kingdom of heaven really is near? Or are we going out saying, well, maybe kind of not sure, I hope so, you know, that what, what do we go out with? Or uh, down in verse 20, for it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. So you have these glimpses of what they go with and uh, these promises of, you know, of the Great Commission of lo, I am with you always. And uh, as the commentary said, you know, we to be sent by Jesus is in some sense to be sent as Jesus. Uh, and but the but then the question is, will we recognize that? And, and does that become enough then to um, uh, to, to empower or encourage our sentness or does it, uh, or not? I think there's both a struggle playing itself out in the lives of Jesus followers, right? That, that, that Mark and Luke, I think in some ways they are more observers of this conflict that's going on between Jesus and the forces of evil. Matthew, in some ways they're, they're embodying it, they, they experience it as well. Um, but there are these reminders, like you said, of God's reassurance. And so we're up for really four weeks of, in a row of some pretty, I think, difficult texts from Matthew. But, in that, but three weeks from today, right, or fourth, fourth in this series of these texts from Matthew, Jesus will say, uh, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Um, after saying, I expect a lot of things from you, and it's going to be really rough. And you're going to wonder, you know, where the, the hardship's going to come from, and you're you're perhaps going to even wonder about, are, am I doing the right thing? Am I embodying this gospel, this, this kingdom of heaven uh, in the right way? Which I appreciate because that's, to be honest, where I'm living these days, wondering, uh, are my traditions strong enough to carry me right now? Um, are some of those old scriptural texts that I've clung to doing more damage than good in the way I've interpreted them or thought about them? And so it's, it's what happens when, when hardship comes is that it, it forces you to figure out what am I going to build upon, right? Or what's, what's the, uh, the thing I refuse to surrender in terms of my faith? And things like that are in these texts, I think especially in this one. But we have to, you have to find them. And once you think you've found it, it's going to say something about who you are and who you understand God to be. Yes. A recognition that we are in oppressive times, that the disciples were in oppressive times. And, and so that, that reality, um, and Caroline, for me, you, you said we, the, the commentator, commentary says that we go out as Jesus. And, and one of the things that I struggle with is this sense of, of um, we know that we are encountering wolves and we are not to become wolves. Uh, we know that those um, who uh, are among us sometimes are are in wolf's clothing, uh, are in sheep's clothing. They're they're bearing the name of Christianity, but they are not Christ-like. And the difficulty for us is in our fear, in our anxiety, in our anger, in our righteous frustration, is to to want to meet power with power, and not be Christ-like. And that, uh, Matt, what you were saying in terms of where we, we will soon hear Jesus say that 
you know, the, the burden is, is light comparatively. Um, right here, it's just a clear recognition that the times are oppressive and you're going to find enemies among, among those you think you should trust. And do we have the wisdom to recognize um, who's faithful and who's actually wearing, you know, the lamb's name, but it's not. Especially when a lot of those texts in Matthew, which, you know, surprise, surprise, are up ahead in the coming months, are, are going to talk about ways in which you will never be able to determine on your own who's the weed or the wheat. This is God's work to do in the end, right? Or the, the bridesmaids who sleep and so on. Uh, will have these, that, which could be incredibly destabilizing, right? Like, like, great, I've been called into this movement where I don't even really know if I'm in or not. But then there's, again, these reminders. Uh, I think Caroline mentioned the Sermon on the Mount earlier. Um, my yoke is easy, burden light. I mean, that's, I think it's part of the way Matthew works is it, it drives us to this point of real worry because like you said, Joy, the stakes are so high, the, the evil is so real. The deception is such a fact of what uh, life looks like. But Jesus, nevertheless, is, <laughs> uh, is gentle and humble of heart, right? And the good news is first and foremost to the poor in spirit. And that, that's where I think you build your theology, of, according to Matthew, around some of those statements. Because that's what he enacts. It's not just what he says. It's also what he enacts. What he and there's an inseparability uh, between Jesus and the disciples, the work of the disciples and the work of Jesus. And so you get... You know, the, the, the language then in 10.1 of authority over unclean spirits, cast them out to cure every disease and every sickness is, of course, uh, the ministry of Jesus uh, in chapter 4, right before the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Jesus uh, went throughout Galilee teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. And so... There's, uh, I, I think that it's important to go back to that verse and say the disciples have already witnessed this to a certain extent. And so then, uh, it, you know, one, one can, if you fast forward to my yoke is easy, you know, that, that yoke, being yoked with Jesus is, uh, is, is something that they've already seen, but it's, it's, uh, it's something that they are then, um, uh, there, you know, Jesus work is their work and that there's, um, I think there has to be some sort of, uh, I don't know, I don't know if I want to say comfort in that, <laughs> um, but, uh, but you know, maybe this is going ahead of ourselves with that, that translation, but my yoke is good. It's probably a better translation. And so there, there's, so where is it that we're, you, what you're talking about, Joy, where is it that we're seeing the goodness, um, uh, that curing of diseases and every sickness among the people, which, um, which has uh, has a lot of a lot of potential of what does that mean? How do we, what kind of what kind of sicknesses are we going to diagnose um, when we when when we're sent out? And that we're being sent out um, not with the tools or the uh, um, the equipment we think that we should go out with. You know, they're not. You know, they're 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 not packing. Um, it, it's almost like the Old Testament, you know, where it's like, uh, or, or well, they're double. Stop, stop, Joy. Say what you're saying. Um, there are two. One is the Jesus teaching uh, the disciples to pray, uh, "Give us this day our daily bread." That's lived out here now, and um, and it's back in the Old Testament in terms of just take enough of what you're going to need for this day. And where we are right now is is. You know, if you know you're going out in tough times, you want to take all the gear that you possibly can. And that's not dependent on Jesus. And when you've got too much stuff, it's also real hard not to want to protect it instead of protecting those that we are sent out to love in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Speaking of... Oh, go August. ahead, Matt. I was going to go to the Old Testament, too. It sounds like you are also, though. I was, since Joy mentioned it. Exodus is the complementary first reading. 
also a story about identity, right? Who do you understand God to be at the core of your identity as a people, right? You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, <laughs> how I bore you on eagle's wings. Um, and you have an opportunity to be a treasured possession among all the peoples. I mean, this is a foundational um, confession, I guess, or a statement in this case about who God is. Mm -hmm. And whether or not the people will be willing to not only hear, not only say they listened, to actually live out, to obey what they are being asked to do, to, to be, as you said, Matt, to recognize the identity is to be different. Um, you've experienced this. God has borne you up. Trust that God will continue to bear you up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This, uh, this Exodus text is along with a uh, text in Genesis 12 and um, text in second Isaiah, Isaiah really 40 through 49, especially. Um, you, you, get, you get three huge moments of a massive disruption in the Old Testament story. Uh, the first is the Tower of Babel. The second is the experience of slavery and exodus. And the third is the exile, the destruction of Jerusalem is exile. And what's interesting to me is how in each moment afterwards, as God reconstitutes the people, it's uh, specifically for the sake of mission. So here, it's not just that you will be my treasured possession, but rather that you will be my treasured possession so that you will be a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. Uh, the reconstitution of the, of the mission that the people are on. And I, I've wondered as we, as the people of God in the, you know, in this late modern or postmodern time, the destabilization of the church as having a privileged place in the society of the West. Um, as we've been destabilized and are being reconstituted, uh, whether or not it's mission, that is the fundamental um, category that we need to understand ourselves as recommissioned for, for the sake, uh, for the sake of mission. Sorry, as you can tell, I am at home and uh, the doorbell is ringing, so I will mute and pass it up to someone else. Oh, oh, the, oh, go ahead, Joe. Okay, I was just going to follow up with what, what you were saying, Ed, um, uh, Ralph, in, in that idea of um, reconstituting the mission, and, and I'm echoing back what uh, you said, Caroline, about um, Jesus and uh, the apostles in Matthew, is in Exodus, we're told, you've seen what I've done. And in Matthew, First, we're told what Jesus does, and now Jesus is saying to his disciples, go and do it. And so I, I just love what you just said, Ralph, in terms of we are being sent out still in that original mission of God that is a love for all the world, uh, and um, that the, um, the displacement of uh, the people of God in our current culture um, whether that's the displacement of in ancient Israel or first century uh, Jews or the current church, when we lose sight of whose mission we are involved in and what is exactly the call that God is calling us to do in the world versus what we might want to do in the world. Which is why then that, that phrase in verse eight is so important uh, which just like totally jumped out at me uh, this time around. Like everything that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Of course, that doesn't really quite work out. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> but uh, but but that is a you know that's a moment where you where uh, I don't. It's a really interesting moment of the human condition of this of this of 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 committing to that, committing to that mission. Uh, oh yes, oh yes, this is what we're going to do. And the ways in which, you know, we hear the, we hear the commission, uh, we hear the call uh, and, uh, and yes, we will, you know, everything that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And then how quickly, uh, how quickly uh, we are sidelined and distracted by 
uh, many, many things, uh, but, uh, but how is it that we, then this becomes a refrain to come, to keep coming back to? It let, come on, it lasts like, you know, 11 chapters in 40 days. <laughs> until the that is, that is pretty thing. good, actually. It's better than a lot of us could do. <laughs> yeah. And Moses is just talking the whole time in between, so. That's true. It's a good point. Uh, should we go to the, uh, anything else? Should we go to the semi-continuous? Or do you want to keep in the complementary vein? Well, I, I just, no, let's move on. But just, just to recognize, I mean, this really does fit well with the Matthew text in terms of, right, their, their texts about mission. Um, and, you know, there's so many things about the Matthew text. I was just quiet while we were talking about it because there's so many things about that but that I don't understand, such as why in Matthew he sent the lost sheep of the house of Israel and told to seek a house that is worthy, as opposed to Luke, where they're just sent to all the villages and stay with whatever house is welcomed. I just don't understand it. But but to just to go back and forth, what does it mean for the sake of the world and for the sake of the lost sheep, comparing it with Matthew? of the house of Israel to be the priestly kingdom. Anyway, I don't know, just uh, um, before we move on to the other texts, any re response to that, solving my perplexity? Exactly, okay. Eddie's gonna jump in on that. I just, you know, I, I think you answered in your own asking, Ralph, in the sense of, what does it mean to be, and I'll use the language, a peculiar people who don't, um, who are responding to the mission of God, not the mission that our politics puts before us or our society puts before us. Even when they, and, and I'm echoing Matthew here, even when they look like or sounds like they are Christ-like, to be able to, to know that sometimes you're going to get a, a wolf in lamb's clothing. And, and that we're called to a specific mission that is more than just, uh, that is more than just what is socially right. But to use your word, Caroline, which is good. Mm -hmm. Well, and maybe this is where the psalm is helpful, uh, because the psalm really does connect with, I think, some of the themes that we're talking about. Uh, you know, what does it, I mean, it, another way to say, but what does it mean to worship the Lord? Uh, what, does that, what does that look like? Um, can anybody tell that we're worshiping the Lord? You know, can anybody tell by our peculiarity, right, that, that this, is, this is our God and not another God? Uh, know that the Lord is God and that the Lord made us and that we are God's and we are God's people, uh, the sheep of God's pasture. And so that the Psalm then could be, I don't know if you need to use it liturgically, but the Psalm could be a reiteration of that, of that peculiarity uh, and that distinctiveness. And um, there is that by our sending and by our uh, the way we are by our worship that there is um there is uh there is something um qualitatively different than in how we are in the world uh and and it and the psalm becomes a way to it kind of come back and say yeah are are, are we worshiping the lord or are we are we uh tending other um, tending other voices or other means by which we choose to be in the world. So I think the psalm, the psalm could function, function in a lot of different ways, but really does, I think, summarize a lot of what we've been uh, talking about so far. I think it's this, it's this, the psalm reminds me again of identity. I mean, I think what we're talking about is more identity than mission, but that's maybe for another podcast, but it's this idea of who is God and who are we uh, in God's eye. You know, we're, we're recording this 10 days before this Sunday. And as I was reading Psalm 100, I'm thinking, I know my congregation's not going to be ready for a psalm like this in 10 days. I, I just don't think we're going to be at the point of make a lot of noise to praise the Lord. And I thought about that some more, about the ways in which praise can be defiance, not a way of pulling yourself out of lament or pulling yourself out of 
uh, resolve as a way of just kind of saying it's okay or we're not going to worry about that for the next hour or so. But there is a way in which praising God in the midst of devastation, in the midst of real heartache uh, and lament and, and repentance, um, at least I think that's going to be what's going on in, in my congregation, um, still can praise. And there's something defiant about that because it's proclaiming finally that the, the, the Lord is God um, and not these other powers uh, in the universe, not things that are the sources of evil or the sources of concern in Matthew 10, for example, but uh, God is nevertheless still Lord. I appreciate that, um, Matt, because uh, in the moment that we are recording this and all that is going on in the world, there, there are uh, different ways that we can look at what could be seen as progress and what could be seen as uh, three steps back. And um, one of the familiarity of my growing up in the Black church has been uh, in the midst of uh, when society seems to be, and I'll use the term as provocative as it will be, um, it has its knee on our neck, that every sense of the possibility of this changing is because of an intrusion of the presence of God. And for that, we will give praise in the midst of the oppressiveness. And, and what's happening in this moment, if, if I can dare say this, is, is that for years, the African-American community has been crying out because of the oppression that is repeated against us. And what is happening around the world as we are recording this is that it's not just folks in Minnesota that are responding to George uh, Floyd's death, but it, it's folks in New Zealand and folks in Germany and folks in Brazil and, and folks in Sacramento. And, and the fact that finally, it's not just an outcry of our community, but that the world is recognizing that if this is going to be dealt with, all of the people have to have to cry the lament. And for that, and I can say, praise God. For me, one of the difficult things about this text, and it really is, um, it's highlighted by the way Joel Lamon writes about it in our um, on our website, is the fact that um, worship communities right now, for the most part, can't gather with singing. And so uh, Psalm 100 is so deeply connected to Old 100, the melody and the, the hymn, All People That on Earth Do Dwell, which is the metrical paraphrase of Psalm 100. And so, of course, Joel writing before the pandemic for us immediately goes there and talks about it. And um, Carolyn, you mentioned even, you know, uh, actually Joel, Joel wrote this commentary three years ago for us and we we're rerunning it from 2017. And just the way you can't imagine communities gathered to sing right now, because singing, right, is especially one of those um, ways through which uh, the, the COVID spreads, especially in super events. And uh, so co Christian communities that are mostly or significantly elderly people more at risk, they can't gather to sing. And so what does it even mean to have this as an appointed text? I don't even know right now. Um, I do think that that one phrase, um, which is so significant, um, know that the Lord is God, that the word know in Hebrew, the word, the, word, the word that we translate as know, is a better way to put it, is not just an intellectual knowing, that um, that word really means to deeply internalize, deeply internalize the reality that Yahweh alone is God. I mean, that's, that's the message at the heart of the psalm and that and that Yahweh's lordship is especially known in Psalm 100 because and this is why it's such a good compliment with Psalm um, with Exodus 19 it's because God has constituted this people he made us not meaning he created us as humans but rather he created us as a people we should maybe uh, get on to um, 
Romans. Um, uh, actually, we haven't even talked about Genesis 18 yet. No, we so, haven't. <laughs> as I mentioned, somebody emailed me uh, and said, hey, you know, I'm going to preach the Old Testament all summer in the semi-continuous. And so I said, well, for sure, I'll talk about it. So the first hard thing, as I already mentioned, is you're jumping in mid-story. Um, this doesn't start at Genesis 1 as it could. It doesn't even start with the story of the cycle of Abram and Sarah. So really, you got to jump in there, I think, and really talk about the first six chapters of their story. Because now you finally get to this incredible story of, uh, of yet again, the enunciation of the birth of, you know, that we've already had the promise of a child and many descendants. And then the, the, in Exodus 5, excuse me, in Genesis 15, the renewal of that promise. And then in 16, Sarah is tired of waiting. And so the, uh, the whole incident of Hagar's exploitation by Sarah and Abram and the birth of Ishmael. And now this incredible story, which ends up with the incredible phrase, right? I mean, the best part about the whole laughter and is anything too wonderful for the Lord. And I can't imagine a whole lot of work better gospel refrains right now for the church than is anything too wonderful for the Lord. Rolf, is that the, is that the best translation of that phrase? That was one question or what were? It's pretty, it's pretty good. I mean, the, it, uh, what verse is it in? You got to have to remind me or so. 14. The, uh, so I can pull up my um, Hebrew. The, the thing about it, um, the thing about that phrase is the root um, that's translated as wonderful here is then the noun that is all throughout the Old Testament translated as the wondrous deeds of the Lord, which usually are things like the exodus and the deliverance of the Red Sea and the plagues that God sent to free the people. So that the wondrous deeds of the Lord are these massive interventions in history for the sake of the people and their mission. And so it's really impossible to translate into English is, you know, the truth is because how do you get a word that captures that? But, but part of it is that is the good news that in this birth of this one boy to this one woman who has suffered, it's that wonderful. It's as wonderful as the Exodus, you know? Mm. So I don't know how else one would translate it. I haven't I, looked to see how, I always look to see how Gene Peterson translates it. Let me look and see. Go ahead, Joy. As you look for that, I appreciate you you doing that because when we look at the Exodus and we look at those, they seem like these big, powerful acts of God. And of course, they fill us with awe and wonder. And this is God showing up, like you said, at the birth of one child to one woman who has suffered. And uh, that that contrast of what should cause us to recognize the awesomeness of God's intrusion into human history? So, yeah, I did check out Gene, uh, Eugene Peterson translates it, is anything too hard for the Lord? And I think that's just not, actually I'd love him usually, not in this case, I think too wonderful is, is a better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, oh, oh man. Sorry, sometimes I will admit having lived through hard times, that translation has been a, 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 good, a good word. Um, you know, is it too hard for God to show up here? Is it too got hard for God to do that? Sometimes, sometimes that refrain works, but I like this wonder in, in this one this time. Last comment is obviously in terms of pairing this with um, the Matthew text, which is sort of by accident in this case, though the whole issue of showing hospitality to the stranger and entertaining angels unaware, which you get in terms of Genesis, uh, Matthew being sent out as guests of the, of the foreigner's hospitality here, of being the one extending hospitality uh, to the guest at our gate. So just the, the, that contrast is worth noting. Caroline? Uh, no, should we go to Romans? Romans. So another option is uh, you could preach all through Romans. 
throughout the summer, 14 weeks in a row, if you so choose. Anybody? Anybody? I love it. <laughs> well, you should, if you want to. Um, be a good chance to get some books, uh, do some reading, dig in, you know, give yourself a little bit of a summer seminar on Romans uh, as a preacher. But as well, it starts off with really a bang. We, we're going to get texts that talk about hope uh, at a time when people don't feel a lot of hope. We're going to get texts that talk a lot about sin and the nature of sin's uh, dominance, I'll use that word, over us and our societies and our systems. You'll get language about the spirit and crying out. I mean, you've got some texts in the next, I think, six, seven weeks that are, um, again, depending upon where exactly you live, but I think can really help not solve problems necessarily, but open up conversations about what, what is the nature of a life of faith right now? And what is the problem, the problems that we're up against? And how are those more than just bad apples or bad policies, but those are something that have spiritual dimensions. Uh, and then what's our, what's our role in this? And what does the spirit equip us to do or not to do? So it could be a great time to dig into Romans. Um, I love these verses here at the start of Romans 5. I, I think they are um, important. They are sometimes criticized for being a little bit too much sunshine. Um, but I think, uh, I, I, I think we've forgotten what's, I, I think I have forgotten that suffering is, is part of the human condition, always has been, always will be. And the question is, how do you respond to suffering of your, your own suffering and the suffering of others? And that's where um, you don't have to be a Christian to figure that out, how to do that well, but it sure helps.